Hi, I'm Brian, and I've been uh, in book publishing since 1977. And basically for the first 15 years of my career, I was trying to learn how publishing had operated for, for 400. And then things changed. And it's a, this is an industry I love. It's someone I've studied, and I've been in so many different capacities. And I can honestly say that I don't believe that our industry has ever faced a period of such complexity in its history ever before. There have been periods of censorship and horrible things that have happened, but in terms of us maneuvering our businesses through these transitional times, you have a huge load of responsibility right now. And so my heart goes out to you as well, maneuver and figure out how we can continue to be, and this is, this is my basic position, we are the premier developers of the best intellectual property in the world. It's the only intellectual property that is peer reviewed, it's been through the editorial meat grinder, I mean it can be trusted, and that is our core strength. And so my, my colleagues, John and Real Tom, uh, John, <laughs> Ron and Joe Tom, which you work with Alan and me at O'Reilly, they are publishing people, and that which I'm about to show you is, was created by publishing people for publishing people. And here's my only technical term, because I'm going to jump away from that as fast as possible. Slicebooks is a hosted software platform, but now we're going to talk about real life. The problem is this, this complexity. Now, I'm, I'm going to take a leap in faith here, which is the last thing someone like me wants to do is to present history to a group of scholars, but I'm going to do it anyway. Which is, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to back up what's going on in publishing and, and how we can move forward so that this intellectual property that we own fits where the consumer is today. That's my goal in this presentation, is, is to be the bridge that puts those two together. So if we start back, let's just look at the Middle Ages with the whole concept of the, of the church basically wanting to control the word of God, right? And so they had tight control was basically one person producing one book and if people wanted access to that book they had to come to the book right then of course our dear friend Gutenberg came along and blew that up and basically said okay well I can have one person who can now create many copies of many books and this of course the church did not like because suddenly the Word of God was available to many people in many ways and increasingly literacy occurred but it basically changed and, and this is the world we still existed in up until about 15 years ago, right? It was that we created intellectual property that we created many copies of, and the business model was we would then go beat each other up to own that customer. I have a guidebook to Australia. No, I have a guidebook to Australia, and we would fight each other, and that's the industry I entered, which is you could buy book A or book B, but you couldn't buy both, and that was, that was my business model. Then Alan and I came along, and some of our colleagues, and we nuked our own industry. <laughs> now, Alan and I work, were working together, but also wove together. And it's not just Alan, there's a, there was a group of us. Alan was on the team that developed the first commercial website, right? For that, we, we basically brought Tim Berners-Lee and, and, and the web over from the CERN labs, and we, he created the first, was on the team that created the first platform, the concept <laughs> of advertising, content, et cetera, right? created for a search engine, I could go on. It was a really interesting time at O'Reilly. Meanwhile, I was working with another team that was developing the first um, uh, desktop website, web server. Up until that time, a web server was something cost $12,000 and men with white coats behind glass walls with people you had to go to to make it actually work. But we actually created the platform that put it on people's desk. And as you might imagine, we were mobbed. Right, just mob, because suddenly this thing, I could have it and I could plug in my computer and I had this slow internet connection, but still, right? And so I thought, hey, we're in the software business. And now I'm saying, hey, we're in the website business. And then I had this doing moment, just doing, right? Because I'm a publishing person. And it's, I'm, oh my God, we're giving all these people their own printing presses, right? We had sowed the seeds of our own destruction at that moment because as Alan was saying, it all comes down to search, which is that if I have content and I have more readers than you, it could be Briar Irwin's health site, right? And you could be in this business for 400 years with the best content. If I have more readers than you, I win on the internet. And so suddenly I realized that we had sowed the seeds of our own destruction because anybody could be a publisher. And suddenly you had many printers and many, we'll call them books, that were suddenly free. 
And so instead of you and I competing against each other, we're now competing against Bri Irwin's home, home cooking, right? And that completely blew up our business models because if you look at it from the consumer's perspective, which is, I want content, I want it now, who can I get it from? And as Alan said, I can wait months or weeks or whatever to get that content, or I can go search and find it now. And I have my answer, which may be wrong, but I have it now, right? <laughs> then things got worse, which is, welcome to today's consumer, <laughs> right? It's now on a mobile device, right? Which is, not only do I want the content that I want, which can be long or short, right? And if it's short and you don't have it, I'm gonna go on the internet and find it. I want it when I want it, which is, and there's only one word, now. If it isn't available now, if they can't touch it now, we lose. We are not players in that marketplace. And that's the reality of the competition that we're dealing with now, is that, that today's consumer has the attention span of a, of a fruit fly, right? And I'm a consumer, I'm talking, I'm looking the mirrors up to myself because you know, as I'm out there searching for things to do, I'll find that which I can find most quickly. And so how do we solve this problem? And this is where, what Ron and Jill created Slicebooks to solve because this was information pain they were experiencing in a publishing environment that then they went out and tried to solve. And so what we have, we have the best content. This is our strength, right? And the one word that, that surrounds our content is trust. It's content that can be trusted. It's a strength. But again, we have the problem, which is how do we find it in, in the cloud of other options? And then there's the concept of, of the long tail, which is the model that we used to be in, which is that if you look at the bestseller model, which is um, you'd have many consumers of little content, right? And where we're, where, whereas we're sitting on gobs of content, where we can get that out to lots of consumers if we can do so efficiently. So I'm gonna hammer this point home, which is to look at content, how we want it, where we want it, and when we want it. This is gonna be the theme that I'm putting together here. And so I'm gonna just move through what this looks like using this, here's the technical term again, this software platform. With Slicebooks, you can take your, your, your EPUB, your PDF files, you can put them into slice books and they're automatically sliced in whatever way you want them. If you're a journal, you can put them into articles. If you have a book, you can slice them into chapters. With slice books, you can take up to 10,000 of these, your titles, put them into slice books and it automatically slices them into these discrete units that you can label, you can apply your own metadata to them, you can price them for whatever price. I can't tell you how many meetings I've sat in in, in publishing where someone has said, you know, this one chapter is worth the price of the book. Well, with slice books, that's now a $2 chapter and everything else is 50 cents, right? So you can play with that. What this does, and again, this is, I'm, well, this is so, we, we didn't coordinate this, but it actually works so beautifully, which is, if you stop and think in traditional publishing, a book is a printed book, and then we went, wow, we can double that by now we have an ebook. Well, in terms of the internet, we've now doubled the ability for people to find us through search, right? With, by slicing it and by applying the metadata, let's say you have a 20 chapter book, you have a printed book, you have an ebook, you now have 20 slices, you now can be found 22 times. And now we're starting to play by the internet's rules. The rules of the internet is very simple. It's what Alan said, you have to be found. And I don't think as, a, as an industry we do that really well yet. But I think we have the opportunity to do that. Why? Because we have so much great content. And this is a way that we can multiply the ability for us to be found. What you can then do is we have a, what we call our, our remix widget. And, and you, this could be a marketing function. And I'll use it as, as an example. Let's just take a journal. Let's say that uh, uh, Dr. Frank Lloyd is an author who has published several articles in many of your journals and the feedback from the marketplace is Frank does great work. Well, I think, you know, he's very popular. You could have a marketing assistant take all of those chapters, compile them into a new ebook. Frank's editor could write a forward. You could put a book cover on it and you could have a new book literally in half an hour. You're taking your existing intellectual property, you're viewing it through a different dimension, you're recompiling it, and 
without having to go through the editorial filter, because it's already been through the filter, you can create a new product that you believe has the opportunity to be found and to be sold. And it's a way to begin leveraging your intellectual property and expanding your business model. And so we have also created a platform that then you can either, if you wish, with slice books, we can create a platform where you can sell these slices. We can private label it for you. In other words, we run the back end of all the ooky stuff. It's all labeled by you, but you can put these slices up where people can automatically find them and, and, and buy them. Or if you wish to have your content made available through our public platform where other people can access it, we can set that up for you as well. And so we've created also a marketplace where this content can be found either on your site or publicly through our site. It's up to you. What's cool about this whole thing is there's absolutely a royalty stream. This is, you're not making your content freely available, right? It's still hidden behind, you know, how these are bundled. But what you're doing is you're creating a way for this content to get out there again. Plus, and this is interesting, we're back to this, you know, this, this fruit fly-like consumer, me, uh, which is they can then go to the public site and using the remix widget, they can create their own content. Last year I went to Australia. I did not go to the west coast of Australia, but I had to buy a book on Australia, and I bought a book this big and needed that much of it. What if I could go to the, this site and I could go just pick up chapters on Melbourne, right? Melbourne and Sydney, that's where I'm going. And I can get it from multiple publishers. I can compile those into my ebook. This is what I want. And then I just load it onto my mobile device and I have it for my trip. So again, it's all about putting that karma seeking consumer, right? Putting their needs together with our content, but it fits their behavior. It's the opposite of the Middle Ages, where people went to the content, this is the content going to them, right? So we're trying to fit the behavior of the, the contemporary consumer with our intellectual property, and Slicebooks is simply the bridge that puts those two together. You have absolute control of it, and there is a royalty stream. So this next part's one that we're working on, and it's that what we've dealt with thus far in this presentation is I want what I want, which is this content only. I don't want the rest of it. I just want this. That's what the consumer is because we're competing with the Internet. And I want when I want it, which is I want it right now. And this allows that, this facilitates that behavior. This then leaves I want where I want it. And so we talked earlier, there's been a lot of discussions about, about what's going on with the academic market today. And as we all know, you know, there's a lot of concern over rising uh, textbook prices, and a lot of professors are Xeroxing chapters from books, they're Xeroxing, chapters, they're Xeroxing articles from, from journals, and they're, they're handing these off to the students, and we're aware of this. But what if instead, the professor that can, could then go to your site and say, I wish to have these three journal articles, these 10 chapters, and this is Dr. Irwin's textbook. This is what I want, right? Um, and so, this is how we're hoping to solve that problem. So this is Steve, and Steve's uh, dog ate his textbook. And in Latin, we like to call Steve hosed, right? <laughs> so what we've, we're creating, and you've seen these things called QR codes. And QR codes are really neat because you can create or you can align a QR code with a slice. You can align a QR code with a book. You can align a QR code with a compiled book, right? It's unique to it. And all you do is you just take your, your cell phone or your pad, just hold it up to the QR code, and it will read that unique set of information. So let's say that Steve then, who's, whose dog has eaten his textbook, goes up to his professor's office door, puts up his phone, scans the QR code. There it is, Composition 101. Steve buys it, and there's the professor's book on his phone. Where does this, there's a royalty stream here, right? But it fits where Steve is at that moment. Where this idea came from, it's a really fascinating idea, is that Ron and Jill were at the Smithsonian Institute, and they were walking through, and there was an exhibition on Julia Child, right? And there are all these people there with their, their phones, their cell phones, taking photos of this recreation of Julia Child's kitchen. 
And so they said to each other, the publisher of her cookbook should be here, right? These people are at that moment of inflection where they were fascinated by Julia Child. When are they most likely going to want to buy her cookbook is at that moment that she's alive to them, right? And that's where this idea came from. Now, I'm someone who likes to hike. And so one of the things I would love to do is when I go off on a new trail to be able to scan and be able to get a trail map from where I'm hiking. Or if you've got people who've just seen a movie that's based upon a book, imagine if on the movie poster is a QR code where they could download the book. It's all about putting the content where the consumer is today. And as Alan alluded, the days of consumers going to bookstores is in peril, right? But that's again about us trying to control their behavior and getting them to go to the content. This is putting the content where they are at that moment of passion or need or curiosity, whatever it might be. We're trying to fit their behavior to where our content can reside. Yeah, got it. So I'd just like to close with a, again, this is a challenge. And it's a, it's a challenge for the industry. Um, the late Senator Ted Stevens once said something we all laughed at, snobs like me laughed at, and he said, the internet is a series of tubes. The fact is he was right. The internet doesn't care what goes to the tube. A tube doesn't care if it's got gasoline or water. The internet doesn't care. What happened is I think our industry got gobsmacked by the internet. And we are still reeling from that effect. We as an industry sit on the best intellectual property. People should pay for it. But we also need to let people know that that it is the best. If I'm someone who's in need, I could be a scholar, I could be a, a person with a health problem. If I know that this content is by a trusted vendor, such as us, and, I, and, and it's important enough to me, I will pay for it. But I don't think as an industry, we have done a good enough job of letting people know they have a choice. You could go to Briar Irwin's you know, home health care site, or you can go and get content from each of us that actually answers the question with some sense of reliability. The, the internet doesn't care. And I'll just close with one quick story. There was this guy I hired on, on my team, who I hired him as a web developer, because, and, he was, and the reason he learned uh, dev web development is because he wanted to follow the University of Nebraska football team. This guy later was the founder of Twitter, okay? He just wanted to follow his football team. The internet didn't care that he came up with something that could be shoved out through the internet. We as an industry have that opportunity, but I think we need to stop being so reactive to what's going on to look at our strengths and to figure out how we collectively, with organizations such as SSP and others like us around the world, can gather together and to take the lead and letting people know that our content is the very best. Thank you.